Amazon is called one of the most influential economic and cultural forces in the world and the world's most valuable brand. For nerds who grew up in the 1980s, it's like a cyberpunk dystopia's wet dream come true. Our next talk will look at some of the curious aspects of this company, the brutal capitalist force it represents, and the future Jeff Bezos wants to create, along with what we can learn from its behavior. Uh, please welcome Johannes Grenzferfner and Yasmin Hagendorfer with what we with we need to talk about Amazon. We need to talk about Amazon: an introduction to capitalism. Uh, Johannes and Yasmin, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah. Hello, Hi. hello, directly from Vienna, Austria. Hello. It is wonderful to see that everything works so smoothly. Uh, I heard that we have a little bit of a slight problem with our video file, but it's totally fine to give a little introduction. So we'll have an introduction to an introduction that's already coming up in the video, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, uh, so it's it's wonderful. So we we uh, we wanted to to talk about something that is relevant to us, and we had a little conversation about what is one of the big themes and big topics that yeah. everyone uses all the time, everyone talks all the time. Uh, and the one thing is Amazon, of course, because uh, if, you, if you see what, what happened during uh, COVID, uh, that they even made more money, that they even got more strongholds in more industries. We thought Amazon is a, a prime subject for something that we need to talk about. Maybe you want to add something to that, Yasmin? No, I think we will pick out some specific, uh, yeah, examples, examples, points uh, that we want to introduce you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that so many people are talking about is capitalism and the critique of capitalism, especially if we see what happened in the last couple of months and what's going on. And we had the idea of like, why not combining a talk about Amazon uh, with a talk about capitalism and pretty much doing like a one-on-one. -on -one. So what is capitalism? Where does it come from? How does it work? What are the basic rule sets about capitalism? And how can we take those rule sets and put them on Amazon and see what specific you know, like law that Marx came up with uh, is re represented in what action, for example, that Amazon is doing. So it's, uh, it's on the one hand, it's an analysis of a, of a very contemporary mega corporation. And it's also, uh, our try to analyze that mega corporation uh, by pretty much the Marxist critique of political economy. So that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> yes. And, and how, are, how are you finding this work so far? Well, the good thing is, so we are both artists and we are both scholars. So at yeah. some point we were thinking of like, how should we do that? And we didn't want, that's I guess why we have the problem now with the video. We didn't want to just like sit in front of the web of a webcam and just like read that out. So we had this idea of like, maybe we should create a whole environment for that. Oh, a cardboard environment, yes. And we made some, yeah like a kind of installation where we sat in and filmed the whole thing. So, yeah. So it turned out to be more of a little art piece by itself than not only a talk. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I hope you will enjoy it soon. <laughs> um, we do too. And uh, we, are, we are doing what we can behind the scenes to get that video going. Um, but um, in addition to that, uh, just what, uh, what can we do to just keep the conversation going around uh, like actually questioning Amazon and uh, its place in, in our current uh, society. So I think, at least for me, I'm not sure what Yasmin thinks about it. At least for me, I think the main problem is, is that many people okay. think that there is something like a good capitalism and a bad capitalism. There is capitalism and capitalism has a specific rule set and that rule set per definition is exploitative. There is not a big difference from the rules between a little, you know, like hipster coffee shop at a corner in Seattle and Amazon. They are both working from the same perspective. They are both trying to make a profit. They are both using uh, 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 labor power that they're usually not paying well or actually trying to make a profit by suppressing the workers. So what we have to keep in mind is that this is all kind of fucked. We are all, we're sitting in a system that is not built on equality, it is built on fundamental injustice. And uh, so, of course, it's easy to pinpoint and say like Amazon is a huge force, they can do whatever they want pretty much. 
At the same time, we also have to start thinking about ourselves and the companies that we work for and what they are doing and how we live our lives. Yeah. I would also uh, maybe add a little bit to, to really reflect on how we work, what we define as work, uh, how we buy, how we consume. I think this is something we should always be aware of. So, yeah. And uh, as, as part of the greater conversation, I mean, like how much of this is like one company like Amazon just uh, deciding to take things in a direction versus Amazon just being maybe a symptom of a larger social uh, ill that, uh, that really needs further addressing? I mean, the symptom pretty much is capitalism. <laughs> the larger societal ill, at least from our political perspective, is capitalism. And of course, you can bug fix that. You can have something like uh, uh, a good working social system like we have in Europe, where you have like checks and balances that kind of like uh, stop capitalism from excessive uh, amounts of like overreach. Uh, in the US, for example, you don't have that. I'm not saying that, that the stuff that's happening in Europe with uh, semi-working social systems is the best solution. I would probably just like say, like, let's get rid of that stuff. Yeah? Uh, let's get rid of capitalism. But of course, that's not so easy to do. I mean, Indeed. capitalism is a totalitarian planetary system. Uh, how can we just like bypass that? There is no way bypass it. Yeah. Okay, um, we're hearing that we have we have your video ready to go. So uh, we will shift over to that. Uh, please enjoy. Wonderful. We need to talk about Amazon, an introduction to capitalism. Thank you so much for having us. By the age of 30, Jeff Bezos already had a steep career on Wall Street, but that wasn't enough for him. Back in 1994, when Bezos was a senior vice president at D.E. Shaw & Co., a Wall Street hedge fund firm, his boss and founder of the company, David Shaw, discouraged him from starting Amazon. And that's where the capitalist hero's journey starts. Together with his then-wife, Mackenzie, Bezos made a bold decision and swapped his office in a New York skyscraper for a garage in Seattle, where he used doors instead of tables, because they were cheaper. Bezos' mission statement for Amazon was Our vision is to be the most customer-oriented company in the world, where people can find everything they want to buy on the internet. At first, he was far from that. On July 5th, 1994, Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos set up an online bookstore. The company, initially called Cadabra, was quickly renamed Amazon. According to the Bezos biography from 2013, Cadabra sounded too much like cadaver. After a startup period of about a year, the site sold the first book to an external customer on July 16, 1995, a tome of more than 500 pages about thinking. Today, a copy of it is on display at the entrance to the Amazon main building in Seattle. What began with books has developed over the years into the largest internet department store in the world. Today, Amazon is much more than that and keeps countless companies running with its cloud services. It offers startup IT applications and store space on the web, for example. With Whole Foods, the group also operates its own US supermarket chain. Here's a graphical overview. Have a look at how tiny the original business, the online retail part, actually is. Amazon invests incredible amounts of money in research and development. And one of its products got a lot of hackers and privacy activists talking recently. Ring is Amazon's home security and smart home company. It manufactures products that incorporate outdoor motion detecting cameras, including the Ring Video Doorbell. 
Protect your home and watch over what's important from your phone. Works with Alexa. Ring was made for ordinary people, but it's also to be found in nearly 700 police departments across the US. Ring contracts give police access to the company's law enforcement portal, which allows police to request camera footage from residents without receiving a warrant. In exchange, Ring gives police free cameras and it offers police more free cameras if they convince enough people to download its app, Neighbors, another app from the Amazon Empire. To partner with Ring, police departments must also assign officers to Ring specific roles that include a press coordinator, a social media manager and a community relations coordinator. The Neighbors app leads people to be interested and to focus not only on the criminal, but on the unusual, the uncomfortable. You can imagine that in some neighborhoods, that focus is going to correlate with race and class, with otherness. Ring is an interesting yet frightening example of how to create a new market and maybe something our fellow hackers should look into. What will the future bring for Amazon? Since January, Bezos' wealth has grown by 74 billion dollars. But he's far from having enough. Amazon's prime streaming service successfully competes with market leader Netflix. With its delivery logistics, Amazon puts delivery companies such as UPS, FedEx and DHL under immense pressure. Amazon is effectively creating its own global postal service. And Amazon is becoming the world's largest pharmacy and insurance company. Rumor has it that Amazon will, at some point, offer a free bank account to all subscribers to the Prime service. Can you imagine what that could mean for the banking world? Disruption might be too small a word. Nobody really knows which industry Bezos might steer up next. At the beginning of June 2019, Amazon demonstrated a delivery drone expected to deliver the first packages in a few months. The automatic and electric Prime Air aircraft will initially bring small household goods such as toothpaste or razors on a trial basis. Amazon holds an airborne fulfillment center patent. It should be called shipping from space manufacturing. Jeff Bezos founded, as most libertarian Uber nerd billionaires do, a space company and christened it Blue Origin. As Amazon continues to grow and Jeff combines the operations from two entities, much like Musk does with Tesla and SpaceX, expect the space mining and manufacturing industry to be spurned by shipping from space to get same day delivery. Sounds crazy, but Bezos has his visions. Drones are only the last mile problem, so to speak. The question you have to ask is, where will these drones pick up the products? For Bezos, the rush of investors to his company also pays off personally, since he is the largest shareholder. For years, the 56-year-old has dominated the lists of the rich. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, his assets are currently around $120 billion. Thus, he remained the richest man in the world, despite an expensive divorce from McKenzie 
in which she received shares worth almost $40 billion. Last September, Amazon was the second public company after Apple to break the magic barrier of $1 trillion in market value. US star investor Warren Buffett's famous investment company Berkshire Hathaway bought Amazon shares for the first time the following spring. The 88-year-old stock market guru had previously praised Bezos in the highest terms, saying, I think that what Jeff Bezos has done is something close to a miracle. Critics accuse Amazon of destroying the retail trade with its great market power and low prices. Amazon is one of the largest transnational corporations and it has been the front runner for anti competitive monopolistic behavior. Amazon has become the ideal example for contemporary capitalism's inequalities. First of all, what is capitalism? And what can we learn through Marx's analysis about Amazon? The origins of capitalism stretch back to the 16th century when the British systems of power largely collapsed after the Black Death. A new class of merchants began to trade with foreign countries. This newfound demand for exports hurt local economies and began to dictate overall production and pricing of goods. It also led to the spread of colonialism, slavery and imperialism. The death of feudalism, a hierarchical system that kept poor people bonded to their master's land, which they farmed in exchange for place to live and military protection, also left rural peasants with no homes and no work. This lack funneled them away from the countryside and into urban centers. Privatization of common land through enclosures drove peasants into the cities to work in factories. The state worked in concert with the new capitalists to establish a maximum wage and clamp down on beggars. Under the reign of Henry VIII alone, 72,000 people were executed for vagrancy. By the 18th century, England had converted to an industrial nation. The dawn of the Industrial Revolution saw an explosion of manufacturing overtake the island. Within those smoky factories and flammable textile mills, our modern idea of capitalism and the opposition to it began to flourish. In 1776, Scottish economist Adam Smith published the treatise an inquiry into the nature and cause of the wealth of nations, regarded as the bedrock upon which modern capitalism stands. Smith claims the title the father of capitalism. Capitalism is a social system, not a form of production and distribution of goods. Anyone who predates capitalism in other parts of human history makes a conclusion by analogy. It is true that elements later incorporated into capitalism existed in antiquity, in the commercial imperialism of the Italian Renaissance and in shell money. However, these forms are blind and coincidental precursors. In capitalism, People own the means of production, say, fancy coffee machines, or servers, or farms, or server farms. These folks are the bourgeoisie. Others don't own the means of production or capital, so they must sell their labor. They are the workers. That's all the baristas and sandwich artists and Ryanair check-in personnel. At its roots, Capitalism relies on three simple things. Private ownership or control of the means of production. Working for a wage. Production for exchange and profit. And it's all sold with the promise of liberty. Simply speaking, the kind of impact that capitalism has on your life depends on whether you're a worker or a bourgeois. The boss. 
Capitalism didn't arise according to natural laws that stem from human nature. Organized violence spread it. The concept of private land and means of production might seem like the natural state of things now. But we should remember this privatization is a human concept. The power and penetrative force of capitalism lies in infesting, changing, even incorporating the totality of social relations. Believers in the entrepreneur mythos argue that a combination of brilliance, innovation, determination and strategic risk-taking pays dividends. Occasionally, it all pays a hundred billion fold. Take a look at Amazon's Alexa service. Data is more powerful in the presence of other data. It's an immutable law of 21st century living. It's one reason why the innovation team working on Alexa is 10,000 strong and why correlating different data sources is enormously beneficial for Amazon. One could almost be in awe of this intellectual pursuit. But Karl Marx's concept of surplus value pushes beyond such a naive view. It explains that Bezos is rich precisely because he never properly paid his workers. The theory of surplus value explains that employers take the wealth their employees create and skim it off the top. In this view, employees produce all the revenue that the business takes in. They manufacture the company's wares or provide its services. That revenue minus the expenses of raw materials, tools, utilities, and so on, equals the value that the employees created using those raw materials, tools, utilities, and so on. Rather than receiving the full value of the work, though, employees receive only a small proportion as wages. The employer keeps the rest. It's a zero-sum game. The more value paid out to the employees in wages, the less value remains for employers to keep as profit. During the third quarter of 2018, Amazon made nearly $1 billion in profit each month. Were this surplus distributed equally among Amazon's roughly 500,000 employees, each employee would earn an extra $2,000 a month. That's quite a bonus considering that most Amazon employees, if they work full-time, earn about $2,600 a month. That amount comes after a hard-won fight for a wage of $15 per hour. Instead, each month, that $1 billion goes to Amazon's leadership. Then the profit is distributed according to the whims of Amazon's board of directors, of which Bezos is the chairman. This position allows him considerable influence in pushing for reinvestment in the company. Such reinvestment is where Amazon's $131 billion in assets come from. Those assets drive its $797 billion valuation and Bezos' $112 billion net worth. No good reason exists in heaven and on earth why a single person should have so much money or hold so much power. Marx has explained that profit must come from labor power. A result of the inevitable exploitation of capitalism is that workers work for less than the real exchange rate of their labor. For Amazon, this exploitation enables the company to sell its products with an exchange value that includes more labor value than the company paid for. According to Marx, that's the theory of surplus value. A greater number of working hours leads to the enlargement of surplus value and profit. The only way to generate as much profit as possible is to make employees more productive without increasing their wages. To do so, Amazon deprives its workers of bonuses, 
worker benefits and longer breaks. Amazon workers are alienated from the products they produce. They produce only for capitalists such as Bezos to profit. By becoming aware of their alienation and exploitation, Amazon employees in Poland formed unions. They created petitions that hundreds of Amazon warehouse workers signed, demanding an increase in salaries and other benefits. One interesting example of how Amazon works in developing economies is Amazon Basics. They've created a store brand of cheap headphones, diapers and foods. In doing so, they compete directly with their marketplace customers. But because Amazon has the means to produce at high volume and cheap costs through exploitation of workers, the items allow the Amazon brand to enter and become recognized in emerging economies. The scheme hooks participants in such economies early. Sort of like giving the first cigarette to a kid for free to get them addicted. Lifetime value far outweighs the customer acquisition cost. Amazon had an incredibly profitable first half of 2020 due to coronavirus. The pandemic hit many businesses hard. In what threatens to be the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, Amazon shares have increased by 70% since the start of the year. We're trying to build the most sustainable transportation fleet in the world. So 100,000 units, that's a large volume of vehicles. We have to get this right. Oh, wow. We have an opportunity to really set the standard. It's hard to not notice the changes around you. We're at an inflection point in, in human history where our actions are shifting and, and fundamentally changing the nature of what this planet feels like to live in. So we're changing the climate. The time we have to make that shift is right now. When you talk about uh, Amazon's delivery fleet, why wouldn't we go electric? And we thought if we took Amazon's package delivery know-how and Rivian's vehicle expertise, and we worked backwards from the needs of the driver, what could we do? It needs to be the most functional, the highest performing, the safest. Everything you see on the vehicle is a decision. We'll mill out the clay, we'll see it in full size, we'll color it up, make it look like a real car, and it gives us a quick visual representation of what the vehicle is going to look like for production. When we succeed, if we displace those gasoline vehicles with an electric vehicle, it'd be a large step forward in making our package delivery business sustainable and it has a positive impact on the environment that's taking a leading role in sustainability. Which is incredible for the planet, it's a good thing. Raising the bar will, will drive others to become more efficient. It's gonna be an iconic vehicle. Amazon has the financial power to innovate. The example of the electric fleet shows the benefits of this force. We can factor in that Amazon is an overall force for ecological change. Even without the fleet of electric cars, having a book delivered to your doorstep in the US has a better eco footprint than using your car to drive to the mall to buy it. Amazon is top of the game in terms of efficiency, which increases their profit. The great ecological footprint is a wonderful side effect of fighting for each cent. Not wasting a cent can also be seen in how Amazon deals with returned packages. It is too inefficient to check out each returned good, be it an MP3 player or a Lego kit. Amazon workers leave returns sealed. Other companies buy these returns in bulk, then sort through the scraps and resell them. Modern salvages in the high-tech junkyard. Amazon equals efficiency and savings. The logics of capitalism and the degree of Amazon's market domination are all expected results. Amazon is a company operating based on capitalism's norms. 
As long as capitalist economic relations continue, Amazon and similar companies will continue to thrive. By the way, do you want to give them your keys? You already know Amazon is the easiest way to get what you need. Like gifts for people whose birthday you've forgotten. As an Amazon Prime member, you'll now be able to use Amazon Key, a new service that enables in-home delivery. With the Amazon Key app, you can also grant access to the people you trust. Let's say you need to remotely manage guest access to the front door of your home, maybe to let in your dog walker, a friend, or maybe to let in a team of home cleaning ninjas. To get started, order the Amazon Key in-home kit, which includes Amazon Cloud Cam and one of several compatible smart locks. Have it installed by a pro, or if you're handy, install it yourself. Once installed, it's no problem if you're not at home. With Amazon Key, you can get your packages delivered just inside your door. You can track your delivery with real-time notifications, watch the delivery happening live, yes. or review a video of the delivery after it's complete. Maybe you don't want your packages sitting out on display. Maybe rain is in the forecast. Or maybe you just need your mom's gift moments before she walks through the door. You know, because you're awesome. Even if Amazon broke into different companies, doing so would only delay the inevitable process of reconsolidation into new monopolies. However, as Karl Marx encouraged, the working class has the power to shut down the production and movement of goods. One step to doing so is to unionize Amazon workers. This movement requires more than the unionization of warehouse employees. Amazon is a multi-layer, multinational company that has an enormous political influence. Thus, more members of the working class must get involved, such as the delivery workers, manufacturing workers, and any other working class employee Amazon depends on. Karl Marx's theory of the contradiction of capitalism has proved to be the reality of our current capitalist system. The concentration of wealth is the current situation. Bess has become the wealthiest man alive while his overworked employees live paycheck to paycheck. Capitalism fosters a toxic, misleading environment. The illusion is that people who work hard enough get paid enough for the work. Amazon might claim to be a company that prioritizes innovation and its customers, but it neglects the well-being of the majority. Amazon might be a marvel of logistics, but it's also one of top private fiefdoms in our market system. Bezos oversees panoptical, freedomless surveillance capitalism. Capitalist companies are not responsible for the public good. That's the sad truth. The public will never take part in any top-level decision. Even the idea of boycotts is strange in a world where Amazon Web Services hosts most giant online services. How can you coordinate through online communication without using Amazon's bandwidth? On the ranking of things to worry about, Skynet coming and taking over doesn't even rank in the top 10. It distracts attention from the more urgent things, like, for example, what's going to happen to jobs. For a glimpse into the future, consider one of the largest companies on the planet, Amazon. Amazon has tremendous scale. We have fulfillment centers that are as large as 1.25 million square feet. That's like 23 football fields and in it will have just millions of products. To deal with that scale, Amazon has built an army of robots. Like a marching army of ants that can constantly change its goals based on the situation at hand, right? So our robots are very adaptive and reactive in order to extend human capability to allow for more efficiencies within our own buildings. And there's plenty more where those came from. Every day, this facility in Boston 
graduates a new batch of machines. All of the robots that you see that are moving the pods have been built right here in Boston. I call it the nursery, where uh, the robots are born. They'll be built, they'll take their first breath of air, they'll do their own diagnostics. Once they're good, then they'll line up for robot graduation, and then they will swing their tassels to the uh, appropriate side, drive themselves right onto a pallet, and go directly to a fulfillment center. To some of us, this moment belies a dark sign of what's to come, a future that doesn't need us, one where all jobs, not just cab drivers and truckers, are taken by machines. But Amazon's chief roboticist doesn't see it that way. The fact is really plain and simple. The more robots we add to our fulfillment centers, the more jobs we're creating. The robots do not build themselves. Humans design them, humans build them, humans deploy them, humans support them, and then humans, most importantly, interact with the robots. When you look at that, this enables growth, and growth does enable jobs. Certainly, history would seem to bear him out. Since the Industrial Revolution, new technologies, while displacing some jobs, have created new ones. While this is the predominant view in the AI community, some think it ignores the reality of today's world. Amazon has been working on automating aspects of the fulfillment process. In the meantime, it uses human workers as virtual robots, treated as disposable units from which to extract labor at the lowest possible cost. Amazon discards them once they are spent. Handheld scanners double as instruments of surveillance, with workers every movement timed, including bathroom breaks. Amazon fulfillment center workers pee in bottles out of fear of termination for going to the bathroom. Tracking wristbands alert workers of any milliseconds spent slacking off. On the hottest day of the year, Amazon had paramedics on hand outside the warehouse to treat heat-exhausted workers. Conditions are dire, with the company opting to have medics on standby rather than fit warehouses with air conditioning systems. With all the scanning and walking on concrete floors, injuries are common. Who needs a replicant when you can grind down the working class in the pursuit of your grand vision. We need to use our vast productive resources to better ends. And as technology allows us to move to a discussion of what sort of planning instead of weather planning, true control of planning must be the non-negotiable foundation of our vision. An aspect of Mark's thinking which remains underemphasized is how he recognized capitalism's tendency to replace labor, animal and human, physical and cognitive, with machines. Marx considered it a force of potential liberation. Fragment on machines, a short but important excerpt within the much larger Grundrisse, lays out the philosophy most clearly. The Grundrisse went unpublished in German until 1939. Worse still, the text wasn't translated into English until 1973. As a result, its prescient observations exerted little influence over communist projects in the 20th century. A tragedy, because it not only contains the first analysis of technological evolution under capitalism, but also the opportunities that evolution creates. Let's quote him. Capital employs machinery rather only to the extent that it enables the worker to work a larger part of his time for capital, to relate to a larger part of his time as time which does not belong to him, to work longer for another. Through this process, the amount of labor necessary for the production of a given object is indeed reduced to a minimum but only in order to realize a maximum of labor in the maximum number of such objects. The first aspect is important because capital here, quite unintentionally, reduces human labor to a minimum. This will redound to the benefit of emancipated labor, as is the condition of its emancipation. 
Marx could not have been any clearer. Competition compels capitalists to innovate in production. Doing so leads to permanent experimentation with workflows and technologies in the pursuit of ever greater efficiency. The logic of market demand means capitalists must produce goods and services as cheaply as they can. It forces them to constantly reduce overhead. This automation has generated suffering and exploitation under capitalism, but under another system, automation represents a momentous opportunity. And so, while production ever increases in efficiency and leisure is valued as a social good, increased productivity doesn't lead to more leisure. Instead, it leads to the production of more goods and services. In fairness to those defending such a view, it was not only founded on economic orthodoxy, but also two centuries of observable change under capitalism. The difference with Marx is, he thought, there was an alternative, and that only in pursuing it would humans achieve freedom. While the average political commentator likes to cast Marx as an idealistic dreamer, he stated his distaste for describing what communism might look like. That irritated many, because one of the greatest minds to describe the shortcomings of bourgeois economy was well placed to suggest what might replace it. Marx's view, however, was that workers in the struggle were uniquely positioned to arrive at concrete solutions. In May 2019, Jeff Bezos unveiled his long-term vision for humanity's future. During an hour-long presentation in Washington DC, the Amazon billionaire described how humans need to leave Earth if we are to maintain growth and dynamism in the future. For Bezos, our future is a series of free floating space colonies called O'Neill cylinders near Earth. This proximity, he argues, can help the planet to avoid exceeding its capacity as the population swells into the trillions. Bezos calls them O'Neill colonies, after American physicist Gerard Kitchen O'Neill, who first developed the idea. These are very large structures, miles on end, and they hold a million people or more each. And this structure rotates to induce artificial gravity. And just how big is it? For scale, here's the International Space Station. And these enormous artificial worlds don't just have to be for humans. Some could be national parks. But whatever they're for, Bezos is sure of one thing. These are really pleasant places to live. Some of these O'Neill colonies might choose to replicate Earth cities. They might pick historical cities and mimic them in some way. There'd be whole new kinds of architecture. These are ideal climates. These are shirt sleeve environments. This is Maui on its best day all year long. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. What does the architecture even look like when it no longer has its primary purpose of shelter? Such a development, argues Bezos, allows us to produce thousands of Mozart's and Einstein's. But what about everyone else? Bezos wants to see himself at the center of history, controlling it. He developed a book-selling platform into a monopolistic mega-corporation. That monopoly works an army of precarious workers to the bone as it extends its reach into new sectors, ultimately beyond Earth's orbit. And us? I guess we'll keep paying our taxes, even in off-world colonies. This is We Need to Talk About Amazon, an introduction to capitalism with Johannes Grinsferthner and Jasmin Hagendorfer. Thank you both for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello. Hello. And we, we have uh, just a few minutes for some uh, audience questions. Um, the one I wanted to 
bring in was uh, how do you how do you feel like uh, COVID nineteen is affecting capitalism just uh, in general? Well, I think uh, of course it uh, it fed some things some things up because uh, people need different goods now. They need face masks. They need uh, supposedly some kind of cures for COVID. Uh, and actually, Amazon put uh, an end to all of that and put down all the supposed cures for all the COVID stuff, for example. But of course, people keep buying other stuff and, and other premises. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the main question for me is, they're, they're, okay, let's say that way. There, there are many people out there who think that COVID-19 will change society, that something will fundamentally be better if yeah. we go through this common trauma, so to speak, we'll end up better because we'll see how bad capitalism is, we'll see uh, uh, that we need change, we'll see racial injustice and whatever. Yeah? Uh, the main problem is that, I mean, Capitalism has gone through a couple of major crises, and I'm not even sure that COVID is the biggest one. Uh, COVID is a crisis of capitalism, and if, if people are not very common to the term, a crisis doesn't mean that capitalism is under uh, is 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 shutting down or anything like that. It just means that the market flips. It just like means that at some point, and COVID-19 is an example for that. That uh, there will be a big purge uh, that the bigger companies who have the power, who have more standing, who have more duration, who have more stamina, let's call it economic, will eat the smaller companies. Uh, and we see it that like big, um, like, air, uh, like uh, air travel companies are dying. There was a moment when, uh, when it wasn't clear if Airbnb would survive it, <laughs> would survive 2020. And I mean, suddenly this is kind of weird. So, uh, and it's, at some point there is there is a consolidation of power and there's a consolidation of capital. And the bigger companies like Amazon uh, will go through that without a problem. They will just like buy up a, sm a couple smaller companies. There will be kind of like this like refreshing phase of capitalism. Uh, there will be, uh, Many many people will be kicked out, and many companies will be kicked out of the system uh, and and die the capitalistic death. But that doesn't mean that capitalism will end. It will just go on. It will go to the next level of consolidation. Of course, first we have to go through a big recession, and nobody is really talking about that. <laughs> yeah, and I think you, at the moment you also don't see really the beginning of this recession. It's just starting right now. It would, will hit us very hard, of course, and this will take some years also. Yeah. So that this is like a long-term affection that we yeah, need to face. Yeah. And at the moment, we're not even, it's almost like we're, we, we're talking about, uh, we can't really see the end result of that yet, because it's almost like if you, if you compare it to, to a sick person, we all like we, we have like a like a high level of fever right now. We don't really know what we are suffering from. So at some point we have to go through the fever first to a, to to a point where we can kind of like regenerate. Uh, but we are right now on the height of the crisis, and we have no idea how that will affect uh, the world. And I mean, uh, I see that there will be. Uh, changes in economy. I think that there will be changes, in, especially national economy. There will be more uh, interest in creating uh, supply chains in the US, for example, or in Germany. So if you see that there's a global economy and you see that you can't get toilet paper uh, because you don't have enough toilet paper, how do you do, deal with that? So we can have face masks, we can have proper equipment because all that stuff is coming from China. So of course there is a nationalistic discourse about that. So how can we strengthen the American economy? How can we produce our own, own toilet paper? How can we produce our own uh, face masks, masks or whatever? Uh, but that also means that we are rising up in national competition. And national competition might end up in the worst form of national competition, and that is called war. We have seen that many, many times, uh, that out of like an economic, economic recession and problems, uh, national competition is amping so up that it will clash into each other as nation states. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in a great twist of irony, uh, as we're as we're having this talk, um, four four tech CEOs are in front of Congress, including Jeff Bezos, trying to explain why their practices are not uh, unfairly squashing competition, um, which of course they are. So uh, we just uh, we just have a couple of minutes left, but uh, I want to get to one more uh, one more question somebody had, which was uh, just what specific and practical changes would you like to see vis-a-vis -vis the Amazon problem? <laughs> and they add socialist revolution <laughs> equals I don't have an answer. Smiley face. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we need a, yeah. I mean, we, we, we have already mentioned it in the talk, but I think the only thing that we can to, do is A, be aware of how that works. Yeah. Don't be apologetic about that kind of stuff. So I personally don't think that there is a good and a bad capitalism. Usually there is something like, you know, the bad capitalism is the casino capitalism. It's usually there is also this like anti-Semitic trope in it. It's like the bankers and, and, and the Wall Street money and the East Coast money and all that stuff. So there is always this like bad capitalism and then there's the good capitalism and that's usually called the economy. There's the bad capitalism and the economy and the economy depends on who you talk to you also have people like Bezos as being part of the economy because he's generating jobs and he's helping us all and blah, 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 blah. I don't even know, like, what was that with New York? Did New York State actually wanted to bribe Bezos yeah. to move like Amazon to New York or something yeah. like that? So you have to go headquartered there actually. And they really backed, it, uh, backed him on knees for that. So can you imagine that? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, state and capital are like a, the flip side of the same coin. The nation state yeah. needs capital because the nation state is, is, needs taxes and needs money. And, uh, and capital needs the nation state because the, uh, because the nation state is protecting private property, is protecting through the monopoly of violence, through police, that everyone's freedom is not bigger than everyone's um, you know, like belongings and private property. You know, like that's where freedom ends. You know, freedom ends at someone else's private property. Mm. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to leave it there because we're just about out of time. But Johannes Grenz Firthner and Yasmin Hagendorfer, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's such a big such a big topic. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but thank you for for watching. Thank you.